So good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Sharif Awad, consultant bariatric surgeon in EMBMI Derby, and uh, I'm professional educational lead and sit on BOMS Council, and uh, delighted to welcome, to welcome you all tonight to the educational webinar. It's the 27th of April, 22. Uh, we have a fantastic speaker lined up in Shaw Summers. I'll introduce him in a moment. Uh, thank you to Ethicon for supporting and sponsoring the educational webinar tonight. Uh, just a heads up for May that we will not be running a BOMS Journal Club or educational webinar for May because of the uh, BOMS Congress, which will take place in Brighton. So hopefully you can join us for that. So the next um, educational activity will be the Journal Club on the 8th of June, and we'll send out a mailing about that in due course. Uh, but for tonight, uh, it's my privilege to introduce Shaw. Many of you know Shaw Summers. He needs no introduction. Uh, so former BOMS president, uh, very, very senior upper GI and very respected bariatric surgeon, uh, works at Portsmouth, Portsmouth University Hospital's NHS Trust and also uh, one of the senior surgeons in Streamline. I invited Shaw uh, to give us a talk about his take on the gastric band uh, and how to avoid uh, future complications. Okay, Shaw, so looking forward to hearing from you and thank you very much for uh, speaking to us tonight. And again, this meeting will be recorded. Please post your questions via the Q&A button. The more questions, the merrier. Let's put Shaw through his spaces and we'll send out a recording to colleagues who couldn't watch uh, the meeting live tonight. Thank you, Shaw. Well, welcome everybody and good evening and thank you, Sheriff, for the uh, nice introduction. I've been uh, asked to talk about the optimal management of gastric bands and uh, I shall just share my screens with you um, because I think this is a really interesting and important topic because we've really fallen out of love with what was uh, the, one of the mainstays of bariatric surgery and certainly in the early days, um, back in the late 90s and 2000s, it was the only alternative to open um, major resective surgery, the old style bypass. So um, let's just have a talk through how this has all happened and why we've fallen out of love with the band and why I think that's actually a mistake. So there was an explosion of interest, as I say, uh, around the 2000s, because we had then had a procedure which in truth the band had been around since the mid uh, 1980s as a product but until laparoscopic surgery really came to the fore we had no way of putting it in other than a laparotomy but all of a sudden the laparoscopic technique for inserting a band was um, devised and it became the first truly minimally invasive bariatric procedure no cutting of the stomach lower mortality and complications than any other surgery, and that's true to this day. Short stay, now it's a day case for the vast majority of patients. Quick recovery, it's adjustable, lifelong. There are no absorption or nutritional issues, fewer life-threatening complications, and it's removable. Not technically reversible, the stomach's not the same, but you can take the thing out and patients generally go back to where they were. The problem we had with the band was in 2011, a number of papers like this one came out um, from Jack Himpens and his group, which really did put a, um, a spear through the heart of the gastric banding uh, world. And they put out this um, paper saying that, you know, nearly 50% of their patients required removal of their bands over a 12 year period. And the reoperation rate was over 60%. <clears throat> So their conclusion was the band appears to result in relatively poor long-term outcomes. But if you look at the graph of those patients who kept their bands over a 10 to 12 year period, and you know, if you look here at the 14 year um, post-op point, most of them still had around 40% excess weight loss. This is at 14 years, a remarkable achievement compare that to the band of the sleeve and you're in exactly the same territory and then on the right hand graph you can see that again compared to um, those who um, have their band out who regain weight they lose the weight loss um, the ones who maintain their band do really relatively well so the conclusion of the paper was really in my view unjustified 
So the band fell from grace. The technical problems were purported to be really um, quite high. And this has led most of us who've done a lot of bands to, to sort of come up with the conclusion that the band is not an easy procedure. It's not something everyone can do. Similar to the Rue on Y bypass, it requires a special um, degree of surgical dexterity to put a band in accurately in every patient and to assess how the band is going to function as you're putting it in. Mechanical complications were high. If you don't put the band in correctly or you're sloppy with the technique or you're just not sure of the correct technique, you will get more problems. And the real problem we had was that unlike surgery where you do the operation and leave the patient alone with minimal follow-up or the follow-ups done by someone else, you cannot do that with a gastric band. Patient education is paramount and you have to have an aftercare infrastructure. And most surgeons around the world practice either on their own or in small groups in the private sector, which is the majority of the rest of the world, um, in the developed world, certainly, you have to pay for your infrastructure. You have to pay for the nurses, pay for the dietitians, and it's difficult to get that right straight from the off. And we've learned all too much the hard way that you have to get the infrastructure right from the word go to look after your band patients. And then we saw the evolution of the other or translation of gastric bypass into the laparoscopic uh, arena and the evolution of the sleeve gastrectomy. And these were deemed to be more effective alternatives. But as I hope to show you, um, I'm not sure that's true in the medium and long term. So the percentage of bariatric procedures that are gastric band has fallen off a cliff and quite rightly so. If you look at the explosion in bariatric procedures, it's been mainly sleeves and the one anastomosis gastric bypass. These are technically simpler operations that more surgeons can do well, and they do not require a massive infrastructure to manage the patient. So the percentage of operations has gone down. But hang on a minute, does that mean there are less bands being done in the world? The answer is no, actually. Um, you know, if as a proportion of the number of procedures done from 2015 to 18, it was just over 3% gastric bands. It's about the same up until COVID struck as a percentage of total procedures done. So this is world, this is, I think, Europe. Um, so actually, it doesn't mean that everybody's abandoned the gastric band. It's just been swallowed by this massive tide of lots of people doing sleeve and leave. It's the easiest way. You don't need the infrastructure. There's no band adjustments. There's no significant aftercare. And there's no tail of further surgery that you need to undertake. Does this mean the band doesn't work? Absolutely not. If you look at the studies of purpose-built gastric band practices over a long period of time, the gastric band has shown, as is Paul O'Brien's, probably one of the model practices, that over a 20 year period, if you've still got your gastric band, you can expect around between 35 to 60 percent excess weight loss. I would love if sleeves performed like this. It, they just don't. Um, gastric bypasses, similarly, I've been doing gastric bypasses since 1995 and they are all starting to come back with weight regain because these procedures fade with time. They fade anatomically, mechanically, and the pouches dilate with time. They're not stretched, they're dilated naturally as all tissues loosen. They also fade endocrinologically. So the hormone changes that we pride ourselves creating by short-circuiting um, the uh, gastrointestinal system or removing the um, stomach in the sleeve, start to fade as compensatory mechanisms try to reverse them. But you can see in the table that the excess weight loss at the maximum years of follow-up for each of these studies from well-respected gastric band practices show a broad range of gastric band excess weight loss from those around the 30 odd percent. There's one 27 one, which I would say 
It's a small study, but obviously they've not got the hang of gastric banding and aftercare, right the way up to 60, uh, 66% excess weight loss at um, 18 year, sorry, 13 years. That's excellent results. That is something that you would compare with any other bariatric procedure for something that's as, um, as innocuous as putting in a gastric band that leaves all the other options for further treatment open to the patient. Does it work in the UK? <clears throat> what about patient choice? Well, here's two studies, um, one from our practice, one from our colleagues up in Birmingham. And these are private clinics. So patients have actively chosen to have a band. They want a band because they've read about it, they understand it. And here again, the Time scales are smaller because we don't have the longer term follow up. But um, in Richie Sengal and David Ashton's series, the, the BMI less than 50 patients will have up to 50% excess weight loss. In our group at 24 months, we were getting 66% excess weight loss because patients had to come back for review. It was part of the deal. They get their reviews, whether they like it or not. And we would adjust either their diet their um, mind or their band or all three. Again, Paul O'Brien did a, a big review of the surgical literature and presented and compared this to his 15 year follow up of over 3000 patients and um, got 78% follow up at the 10 year mark, which is fantastic. No mortality with primary procedures or revisions. That, you cannot say that for that cohort of patients having resective surgery. And here's the results. It's nearly 50% excess weight loss at the 15 year period of his personal cohort. What they've also done is priced in what you have to do, the kind of um, infrastructure you need to do that. What, what did you need from consultations, adjustments, how many consults per year, and then you work out what you need, how many full-time equivalent medical practitioners, dietitians, specialist nurses. You then work out, well, what is the workload in terms of revisional procedures at a set rate, etc. So you need reasonable reimbursement for the work, and this is where we run into trouble in the NHS and privately. How do you build in reimbursement for the long-term care? You need protocols that everybody agrees and works to, that everyone knows where the cutoff points are for intervention and not intervention, and you need the data. And unfortunately, until MBSR came along, our data management, certainly in the private sector, was non-existent. And I think that was a great shame because we've got good data there. And in Paul's series, one and a half full-time equivalent doctors achieved over 70 tonnes of weight loss but it means you can actually calculate this. And this is why single-handed practitioners really struggle with the band. You know, you need the workload. It's a mathematical formula. The more bands you put in, the more the workload grows and the more infrastructure you need. And this is really difficult for surgeons to get their head around and to invest into. Well, what about the revisions after this? And again, we are learning lots about the band and there are eras of gastric banding as Paul O'Brien has shown here, the perigastric era, which we can largely discount because it was a mistake, the past flaccida era, which works well, and then the newly designed lap band um, and the repositioning, the absence of a formal gastrogastric tunnel. You can see the incidence of enlargements, erosions, tubing problems and explantations plummets. So going from something like 60 odd percent with the perigastric era of um, direct problems from pouch enlargements and erosions, right the way down to sub 10 percent um, in uh, up to 2011. It's even lower now with the, the techniques which I'll show you shortly. You really shouldn't be getting trouble with um, pouch enlargement or gastric herniation through the band. I don't like using the word slippage. It implies we've let the band slip. It's not. It's the fundus herniating up because the damn thing's too tight. And I'll show you data on that shortly. 
Erosions should be a thing of the past. They are, in my view, caused by trauma to the gastric wall at implantation or overt infection. Port and tubing problems. Again, the old days of rooting the tube where you liked, it doesn't work. You've got to have a smooth, lazy S um, travel to the band. If you've got an acute angle, that tube will fracture in time. And as a result, very few bands are taken out for either intolerance or complications these days. The only bands we end up taking out are ones that have been neglected in patients who have no idea where to get their long term follow up. Um, again, the summary table, excess weight loss range, and this is in the era 2013 before we had long term data with the sleeve. Um, it's not far off where you have with the, uh, the gastric bypass between 30 and 60 to 70% excess weight loss. So the band, it does have a role. And in my view, it has a very important role in the low BMI and the young patients, the ones at the start of their weight loss journey. So how does Paul achieve this? If you're going to prevent long-term problems or improve your long-term results with gastric banding, let's learn the lessons that, that Paul came up with. Patient education. If you've not seen the eight golden rules videos that he's done, you're missing something. These are really, these are the model of how we as clinicians should be interacting with the public and putting our knowledge out there for the patients to be able to make good decisions. So please do watch the eight golden roots YouTube videos. Attention to surgical technique. It has evolved. It is nothing like the way I first put bands in. It is a different technique of how you do it. Close follow-up, it's scheduled and it's free access. Patients need to be confident that they come back um, when they need. Um, certainly in the first two years, it's scheduled. They come back every three months, whether they like it or not, because we want to see them. They need to know what the warning signs are, as do all the staff and the traffic light system that Paul came up with, with John Dixon, absolutely crucial. Everyone has to understand this if you're gonna avoid some of the problems I'm gonna show you. You need to intervene early for problems. Don't just pat the patient on the head, let the band down a bit and then blow it up again. You need to look, see what's going on. And the only way to do this, in my view, is a textured barium study, not just liquid barium, certainly not gastrographin. You need barium with a bit of porridge. Um, I think David Kerrigan was the first to describe this as a technique. And he was absolutely spot on with it. You need to stress the band as if sloppy food is going down and then you'll see what the problems are in real time. And patients need to know that at the end of their paid for package, they can come for um, long term follow up anytime they like. Open door access. We will only charge you if we intervene, but come and talk to us. Do not sit at home regurgitating your own acid because you're frightened to come and see us. So here's the YouTube videos of Paul. Please do take a note of them, have a look at them. They are great instructive videos of what patients really want to, to know. Um, and the, um, the actual view count on these videos, not the, the one on this channel that I've shown you, but the view count is huge. Lots of people have seen these. So the optimal green zone. Far too often patients used to go and get a cheap band in Europe they would have the thing blown up as tight as a duck's bum um, so that they got dysphagia and they thought dysphagia was the way the band works. And as you can see from the horror show on the right hand side, you got this kind of thing turning up in clinic. You got absolutely shattered pseudo um, achalasia pictures where the gullet is just shot. It, you get slippages or herniations of the fundus up through the band and massive pouches proximally. And, you know, in the lower pictures, you can see the gullet is just ruined. There's nothing you can do with that gullet. You can release the band as much as you like. It is never going back to the shape and function that it should be. One of the most important things that happens almost with every gastric band is the esophagogastric junction will get stretched. It's just in the nature of how the band works. Even if it's correctly adjusted, you will get some stretching of the OGJ so that if you ever remove a band, 
patients are at a much higher risk of getting reflux, even without the band in situ. So this is different to slippage associated reflux, uh, herniation associated reflux, where you've got a proximal pouch that's making acid. This is a destruction of the valve function of the lower esophageal sphincter due to dilation at the hiatus. And then once the band's out, you can get much easier reflux which paradoxically is a good excuse to offer the patient a bypass. Um, so a <clears throat> couple of very uh, recent and very interesting papers uh, came out, both from Naples, both with long-term outcomes from gastric banding. And this one from uh, Francesco Lucido and his group, including the lovely Gian Mattia Del Genio, um, they followed their 700 odd gastric band patients in two distinct groups. One group that required very low volumes of fill, less than three mils, and one the group that required more than four um, mils of uh, adjustment. And they tried to keep the groups as they were. And so if you had a low adjustment band, we, they just said, right, you stick with that. That's where we're gonna keep you. And the other group had the four mils or more fill. And they assessed um, criteria like assessed weight loss, Barros score of quality of life, etc., and monitored them for um, at least, um, I think it was three to five years. Where are we? Uh, yes. So 74 months for the low band field group, and it was 52 months um, for the high band field group. And they found that if you have your band adjusted in the green zone and never went more than that you had better excess weight loss than if you have a tight band so yep you get getting me right if the band is really tight you get worse long-term weight loss after you know five six years the weight loss is not as good and that is shown by the quantity of band fill on the lower graph um, as the quantity of band fill goes up the spread gets um gets more and actually you get um generally a trend towards lower um excess weight loss so why is that um if you look at the various um complications things like migration or slippage are much higher if you have a tight band um, the need for removal goes up as a result of that the need for deflation goes up as a result of that. And the need for redo surgery goes up for patients who have a tight band. They also are much more symptomatic with um, episodes of postprandial vomiting, uh, reflux, epigastric pain and food intolerance, uh, although that is the similar across the group. So it's not like the low band fields were not restricted. They were still restricted, but they um, were not having the ex extra problems of migration slippage and the need for deflation. So the moral of the story was don't do your bands up too tight. It doesn't help. It causes the problems. The second study from Mario Musella, very uh, well known, established Italian surgeon, decided to follow 76 sleeve versus 76 band patients over a 10 year period. And of course the sleeves do better. They, this is a reverse Y axis. They have a better excess weight loss um, and uh, the bands take a while to catch up. But at 10 years, they do. They actually have a, a, a similar non-statistically significant weight at 10 years and this is a, a study that really did try and keep hold of their patients so they've actually got nearly 80% uh, follow-up at the 10-year period. So all pariatric procedures are tools, patients need to understand that their expectations have to be realistic, they have to understand what they need to do to prep for surgery, how their surgery is going to work, their obligations in the short, medium and long term, nature of their follow-up requirements, and what the signs are of malfunction or complications that they need to actually come back to us as clinicians and say, I think I'm developing X, Y, Z or a problem. 
So the surgeons need to understand that technique is important. You don't just bung in a band around the OGJ and hope it works. There needs to be accurate placement of fixation, easy tube routing with no kinks and bends. Port needs to be in the right place so it doesn't mess about. A defined follow-up schedule and investigate and intervene if the patient's not right. So how do I implant a band in today's day and age? Let me show you. So, sorry, just close my window there. So let me share the screen with that on it. So here's a band I put in recently. I will speed it up just for the sake of um, brevity. So I always check for a hiatal laxity or a hernia. If it's a formal hernia, I'll repair it posteriorly. If it's just a loose hiatus, I'll put in some stitches through the crura anteriorly. I always use a 34 French bougie. I don't use a balloon anymore. I don't believe a balloon is helpful because I think that encourages you to put the band too low and you have a higher incidence, in my view, of um, herniation of the fundus or slippage. So three little stitches in the anterior crura and then a very gentle dissection round the back to make the posterior tunnel. I've already opened the angle of hiss because I want to see the left crust just to assess for laxity. So once I've gone through there with just fingertip pressure with the grasper, no special pinky trigger or expensive disposables, just a gentle grasp around the back. You then gently touch the tubing, no manipulation or hard grasping of the tubing because that will help it fracture in the future. Again, when you're pulling the band through, the only bit you can pull is that bit distal to the arrowhead, and the band then pops into position. It's already been flushed and inflated. We then post the tubing through, feed it down, and then what you must do, and actually the line in your notes is band locked and checked. You have to check that's done because if the band unlocks itself, I'm afraid there is no defense of that. You also need to look and see whether there is a enough uh, stomach just above the band to get your stitch in. Um, I subscribe to the uh, so-called Birmingham stitch where you um, basically placate or rush up the fundus with three or four big bites and then you stitch that either to the just distal to the esophagogastric junction if it's easily visible um, around the fat pad or I will put it into the apex of the left crust if I can't see the stomach because what you want to do is try and stop that fundus from going up through the band that's all it's designed to do so you can either stitch it to the crust or the stomach if it's feasible the only downside of stitching it to the crust is that occasionally you can um, cause a bit of left shoulder tip pain. So once that's stitched up there, that's my only nod to gastrogastric tunneling. Um, and what I now do is a plication of the fundal cap. So basically I will again plicate the fundus to basically shrink it and also turn it into a blob of gastric tissue, which will find it very hard to herniate up through the band. Again, I saw Paul O'Brien doing this latterly before he stopped operating. He was doing it much closer to the lesser curve, but I pointed out to him that if I ever needed to revise that to anything, I've then got his stitches to unpick. So I've put the plication here and touch wood, I've not had a slippage since. Um, it's not to say it won't happen, but I think this will help reduce it. So I do two or three plicating stitches on the fundus just to try and stop the um, stomach or the fundus specifically from herniating up and causing a posterior lateral slip. So once that's done, we then, uh, let's just get that 
not tied. Apologies for my slow not tying. So once that's done, we take the camera out and put it down through the gastric band access port point port. Um, I put the needle holders through the left upper quadrant port, pull the band tail out through that into the subcutaneous tissues, and then use the needle holders to push the band tubing through the subcutaneous fat to where the port is due to reside. And once I've sutured the port um, or laid in the sutures for into position, I can then re-insufflate pull the tubing in so the join is intra-abdominal and that's the end of the procedure. So let's get back to the presentation. I promise I will finish soon. Um, so let's get back to that one. Where were we? So how do we get this to work in the UK? You construct a safe patient pathway. You need the right team the right environment and the contact points that patients can rely upon to actually get their treatment. And there's many different successful models. I won't tell you ours is the best, but we've got a pretty good one now, but they all invo involve regular follow-up with active recall. You call the patients in. Patient education is vital, group sessions, but nowadays we do webinars and we assess their understanding at every step of their way before surgery. You do accurate surgery, as I've just shown you, and you have quality follow up. Does it have a place in 2021, 22, uh, as we are now? Well, of course it does. Um, but in my view, it's the best option for informed, compliant patients, especially the young at the start of their weight loss journey and volume eaters, where the band clearly will help address that. Um, there's a growing acceptance amongst uh, bariatric specialists that some patients, I think many, will need more than one treatment or procedure to get them through their lifestyle. And if they go in with the biggest bang first, what are you going to do when their bypass fatigues in 10 to 15 years and they're still aged 40? Um, they've got a lot of time for you to consider how you're going to make that better. I hope that the GLP-1 agonists will be the answer, but um, I'm not seeing much evidence that they're going to let us use that in the NHS. In my view, the band is less effective in the elderly, the very high BMI where, you know, 30% um, excess weight loss really won't touch the sides uh, and multiple comorbidities. And these were shown by a paper from uh, the BOMS president, Vinod Menon's group, that um, multiple comorbidities and high BMI do less well. So the guy considering all of this with his uh, leaning on the back of the chair is Cesar Roux, who uh, we pay homage to every time we do a real my bypass. But the band, I believe, still has a place. I still think we should be doing a lot more of these and offering it to people who just don't want their guts chopped up. Um, there are so many patients out there who won't come near bariatric surgery because they're frightened they're going to have their stomach stapled. They will have a day case band though, and a band is better than nothing. My recipe for success, education, careful technique, get your aftercare right, do the right protocols for adjustments, have your alert and rescue systems in place, and the long-term follow-up is understood by the patient. They know that they will need this. It's like having a vintage sports car, it's going to need follow-up and maintenance. And as a last slide, um, if you thought the by band sleeve study was going to put paid to the band, look at what the uh, main authors of that study, Richard and uh, Jim Byrne, have, uh, have sent to the editor of Obesity Surgery. Don't throw the band out with the bathwater. Stop prejudging the issue just because some people find it difficult to get good results. Um, the idea is you get better and you copy the practices that do it well. Thank you. I'm very happy to answer questions. Uh, thank you so much, Shaw. Really informative. And I didn't think you were provocative at all. You promised provocation, but I thought you were very measured and uh, certainly <laughs> lots of really positive, uh, good and useful and practical messages coming through. So I was shocked to see that you've stopped doing or you don't do a gastrogastric tunnel. Can you talk me through 
that you don't take a couple of stitches to put the GG tunnel in. Can you talk me well, through I, why, why you don't why? do that? Well, I, it's the question of what are you trying to achieve mm. with the gastrogastric tunnel? You're trying to stop the stomach distal to the band from migrating up through the band due to food impacting in the gastric pouch, stretching it, putting tension on the wall and pulling stomach up. In my experience, you know, I've seen plenty of bands where you've got a slippage, uh, let's call it what most people call it, a slippage, and the tunnelating stitches are just rotated round where the, the, because it's actually pulled everything round and you've got a nice big pouch above, but the stitches, the tunnelating stitches are still there. So they're not doing the job. Plus, um, I find that by pulling the band down to get enough stomach to put a stitch in, sometimes you're actually encouraging the band to be lower and the, you're altering the phi angle because one of the ways we tell if a band is slipping or not is what is the angle of the band on an AP radiograph. So by pulling stomach up to get a stitch into, you're actually pushing the band down. So over the last 10 years, I've abandoned doing a formal tunnel with three, four stitches because I just thought, what is this achieving? I'm still getting slippages. You know, I'm not going to do more stitching. What you know, do I do less? Now, the Bristol group, when um, Sally was still, Sally Norton was still operating, were using the mid band, which is a, a wide flat band, and they were doing no gastrogastric tunneling at all. And their slippage rate was no different to the rest of us. Okay. So I think um, a single stitch laterally, either to the just above the OGJ as you uh, below the OGJ, sorry, as you saw me do, or to the adjacent left cross. If you can't see it, if it's covered in fat, there's no point stitching it to fat. It's just going to pull through. That is not a tunnelating stitch. And you, if you can't see muscle and get all of stomach, you stitch it to the cross so that that fundus is stuck there. Yeah. won't come round and then those two crimping stitches as I call them just to um, take up the slack if you like of the anterior fundus should hopefully stop that going up okay so and what's it, your phi angle on your AP for your patients so um, usually it's about 45 yeah something like that okay okay um, all right Okay, now I've I've made loads of questions for me to ask you, but actually let me let me put to you a few of what the audience have asked you. So, uh, yeah. Bryony is asking. Uh, so a lot of her patients are at least seven years post-op. Uh, how often should they be seen at that sort of period? So well established on the band kind of thing. So well established, if they're stable and happy with how things are working, I would leave them alone. But they have our number for problems or queries you know and they, they usually go through to the practice nurse um whether it's nhs or privately and if they hear any of the warning signs like you know nocturnal noise like washing machine noises coughing at night acid reflux they get referred to one of us and they get a barium swallow straight away um yeah that, uh, so i think if they're fine and happy you leave them alone to get on with their lives but you tell them that, you know, if you develop any of these and they've all got the sheets, that this is a warning sign and that problems will come. So a lot of the patients we inherit from elsewhere say, oh, my band's tight. I'm, I sort of I can manage a sip of cappuccino at lunchtime and I'm licking crisps for some flavour. You know, yes, you're thin, but that's a warning sign. Where the thin gastric band patient, they're a problem <laughs> waiting to happen. Definitely. I've never seen a thin gastric band patient who doesn't have something in the offing. Either it's, you know, a, a esophageal failure because of a, a big dilated pseudo stomach or that they're evolving a, a bad slip. And it's just going to be a nightmare from then on because you can't offer these people sleeves if their esophagus is wrecked yeah. because it will never empty. And bypasses are no, not straightforward again. You know, you can get the metabolic hit for a while, but then what are you going to do? OK, uh, good messages. Next question for you. So uh, Abu Zahra Hussein, uh, so he's quoting a paper in the Annals of Surgery 2017. It is in the chat. If you want to open your chat, the figures are there. But a study of 52,000 from the US, yeah. annual removal 6% and two thirds of patients needed revisional surgery. 
So do, do you quote this to your band patients? These particular Yeah, we things? do. Um, you know, if you're honest, what about the long term data with sleeves? If you look at countries which were the early big adopters of sleeves like Israel, they virtually abandoned the sleeve overnight. It's all OAGB now. Mm. Um, so, yes, we do tell them that, you know, I quote them our figures, which is um, that at 10 years, uh, one in 20 will have uh, the band out and that there will be problems with um, symptoms that we may need to deflate, we may need to investigate, we may need to reoperate to either reposition or deal with a, a slippage, because you can have a slipped band and re reposition. I, I would reintroduce the band to a new tunnel and do a different sort of hitching stitch to get it in the right position. So yes, we do tell them, but, you know, if you look at the sleeve long term, you know, 25% de novo reflux, what are you going to do for these patients? A bypass now? You know, the worst case scenario with the band is you take it out, gone, you know, back to square one. You've got all the options in the world open to you now. If you've done a sleeve, OK, the first three years are magical and it's wonderful, blah, blah, blah. But if they develop bad reflux, heaven, to be, heaven forbid, Barrett's, what are you going to tell them then? How many of us warn patients about Barrett's and malignant risk when they're coming for sleep? Not many of us, I bet. Uh, it's not something I routinely tell patients. I probably should. Would I put a band in a diabetic patient? Yes, if it's mild diabetes, tablet controlled, and they don't need to lose too much weight to get control. You know, always remember John Dixon's dictum. I don't know many people who remember John Dixon now, but 10% weight loss is powerful medicine. 10 percent that's all and you will put a lot of diabetics into remission you don't need to go for normal weight we have to lose this obsession with kilos lost it's quality of life mm. and it's you know with patients who lose weight there is always a balance between the amount of weight they lose and their quality of life adjustment that they have to make to lose that weight it's not all a one-way positive bargain Okay, uh, I'm going to switch to the Q&A bit. Um, so Mary is asking, is there an upper BMI limit for a band in your practice? No. Uh, a BMI I, above 50, for example, or what? What do you... I, if it's the only thing the patient will accept, if they say, look, I don't, I won't, I don't want a sleeve, I don't want a bypass, all I'll have is a band. Yeah, because it's much better than nothing. They're never going to be skinny with a band. But it will be it will give them enough weight loss to make a difference to their quality of life. Um, you know, there are some spectacular results with bands. If you match the patient characteristics and the patients really engage with the program. But that's really hard um, and they don't get the metabolic hit with the band. But I think there's some interesting studies in generation now where it's band plus GLP-1 agonist as a treatment. I'd be very interested to see what the results of that kind of study are. Definitely. Uh, another two quick ones for you. So how long can a band be left in place? Yeah, a lot of um, disinformation going on about that. Um, the answer is lifelong. They are designed to last a lifetime. They are not a temporary or a 10 year. It's not like a breast implant or, you know, um, well, unless it's a job creation scheme for someone to replace bands and put new ones in. If it's not broke, don't fix it. OK, um, one more and then I'll ask you one from me. Do you have a standard protocol for inflation post-op? Yeah, slow and steady. You don't ramp it up to ramming speed in the first inflation. So um, generally, we just leave what I call neutral band fill. In other words, you fill it full uh, for band placement. And then when you cut the tube, whatever wants to come out comes out and then you jam on the port and you leave it at that. And then we do maybe uh, one mil at the first fill or half a mil at the first fill. And then it's half a mil, half a mil until they come for the final buns, which are about a quarter of a mil. But we let the nurses and our um, band filling dietitians figure that one out because they have the best relationship with the patient and they know to, how to read the signs of what is and isn't working. Okay, good. Um, I've got a question for you. What's your view on capsule formation? So uh, the capsule forming under and above the band leading to dysphagia, you just cannot stabilize that patient on any amount yeah. of fluid fill or defill? 
you, you've absolutely hit the nail on the head there, Sheriff. Um, this is a, a, a very underreported and, and uh, I think misunderstood phenomenon where some patients will form a quite a, a significant cicatrix or capsule within the gastric band around the stomach. And this in itself will cause the symptoms. So you can deflate the band and they feel a little bit better. But the second you try and reinflate, they're, they're, the adjustment is on a knife edge, as I call it. It's either too tight or too loose and you can't get them near that. And when you reoperate on these people, either the scarring or the capsule has kinked the band on the liver or it's just twisted so that they've got like a u-bend for the food to go around and it's never going to work properly or you've got this tight ring where you take the band off and it's still tight and when you actually cut that uh, capsule uh, the cicatrix as I call it it's really quite thick and you have to snip it quite hard with the scissors and you think well actually that's been the problem not the band mm -hmm. is it a reaction I don't know. Some people do react more to foreign materials. Is it um, subclinical infection? Again, Paul Super used to tell me that, you know, he does believe that some people can just have a contaminated band and live in harmony with it. Their immune response keeps the um, infection limited to just around the band, um, but they will get scar tissue around there and, and it will encapsulate. Um, yeah. So I think this is a, an issue. I just don't know how you would identify that other than by laparoscopy yeah we see i mean we see a lot of derby has put in a, a, maybe 1500 2000 bands in the nhs wise uh, for our regional patients and we see a lot of these patients come to mdt the cns's who look after the bands they just cannot get them to get on with the band at five seven years or so the barium looks perfect endoscopy spot on and it's this balance between dysphagia versus lack of restriction, as the patients yeah. call it. Uh, and then we're forced, the only option then is to remove the band. We go in very tight capsule, open it up, and the dysphagia and reflux problems result. So it's difficult. But I agree. Yeah, it under, is, but at least then you've got, uh, you know, a world of possibilities if they're, way, yeah, if they're still yeah. eligible for surgery. Say, Literally. OK, we well, had the band for X amount of years. Let's move on to, to something else. And, and I don't believe that's a failed treatment. I think it's just, you know, we have a hierarchy of treatments we can offer yeah. patients. You know, if all diabetics were treated with insulin, that's the same philosophy as all obesity is treated with a bypass or a DS. It's like, actually, we have to match the treatment to the patient. It's what they'll tolerate, what they'll accept, and what is appropriate for their level of obesity. Yeah, so you've been absolutely brilliant. Uh, I've learned loads from you, so I'm very grateful for you giving My pleasure. time tonight. So thank you ever so much. Thanks to the audience, the sponsors. Uh, so we'll share a recording of this uh, on social media in the next couple of days. But thank you very much and see you at BOMS. Yeah, see everyone at BOMS. Have a good evening. Bye. Bye-bye.